I don't know if y'all have heard of ghillie suits before. Do you know what those are? No. Oh, God damn. It's perfect. It's a perfect analogy. So a ghillie suit is like, if you see a sniper, they'll put like bushes and grass all over them. It's, it's a suit. It's called a ghillie suit. So you're hiding. It's basically like you don't see it and then it pops up and fucking kills you. <laughs> Welcome to this one on podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, and challenging norms. Today, it is episode 71, and I am talking with two awesome Aussies with a podcast of their own. But no, 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 this is not just a smart nonsense Bush Leagues podcast. This is the real deal. And why do I say that? Because they have gotten over 3 million downloads. They've had some of the best authors out there. I mean, name an author, they've probably talked to them. Seth Godin, Simon Sinek, Derek Sivers, Kevin Kelly. I mean, who, who else is there? BJ DeMarco. I mean, it's literally... Everyone that's written a good book, they've talked to him. Now I get to talk to him, and it's a blast. I mean, these are some cool dudes, and you see why. Why they're so successful. Because they do their preparation when they're reading all their business and, and personal development type books, psychology, philosophy, everything. They do their preparation, and then they just riff because they're the boys. They're, they're dope. They're my blokes. <sighs> That was painful saying, sorry, boys, but (laughs) it's an awesome podcast. We talk about their journey from uh, just two guys hanging out, trying to meet girls and have a book club to now this powerful podcast, the lessons they've learned interviewing some of the best authors in the world. I mean, the the books they like, the what you should do as a young, say, 20 year old that wants to just explore and, and create everything's here and it's for you. I had an awesome time with the conversation. If you want to find the two people I'm talking about, they're both named Adam. One is Adam Jones. One is Adam Ashton, Ashto, and Jonesy. They're ballers. So you can find them on their website, youwilllearn.com, because that's the name of their podcast, You Will Learn. They got everything there. If you want to see their top 50 books, it's youwilllearn.com slash top 50 there you can get a PDF. It's all dope. Their, their website's sick. I mean, they're just sick dudes. I don't want to ramble for any longer. Let's get into it. This is episode 71 with the Adams bros. How did you guys find me? Because I think you guys followed me or something because I maybe we put out a video. It was on Twitter, right? I'm not sure which one of the books. Do you, you yeah, all remember I by chance? Saw, um, might have been personal MBA, I think, maybe. Um, I haven't. We did money and um one more i forget the book but one of the books i assume you saw or like yeah yeah yeah. it was one of the one of the, one of the recent ones and we saw um uh yeah i just saw you i saw you post it up and then i saw you commented on someone else's post i was like hey and these guys look like they're doing some cool stuff as well <laughs> so I, I thought i'd give it a follow I checked out a few vids and uh it looked good it looked good yeah money that was the one i saw actually yeah uh and i saw i think it was your mate was talking about the story of the dude on the horse uh and like how money was created and stuff like that that was that was a good story yeah, the Mongols, the fucking Mongols, they're crazy. That's what I love. It's just like uh, these these stories, just repackaging them because most people don't have, or at least they claim to not have like eight hours or 10 hours to read books. I mean, I can barely do that. I can only do Audible. But y'all have done it, done hundreds of them at this point, which is mind-blowing to me. Um, I, I guess what I'd like to do is, I, I know your story more or less, but in a nutshell, if I can recap it, you can fill in some, some gaps where it might be. But you two, did you first meet at working at the bar, but you, you also went to the same university at the same time? Is that part more or less accurate? Yeah, that's right. So it was about, what, six years ago now or something and just at a local shitty old pub at our local town. <laughs> um, I loved working there. So, you know, I had a lot of enthusiasm and everything. Can't say the same about Ashto. He was one of the worst, <laughs> worst uh, pub barmen that you'd ever come across. He really just didn't. I think. Were well, you just? I don't know if you were pinching beers or giving out too many freebies. And, <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I started strong, um, and then the the manager switched over. The old manager I got along with well. The new manager just we did not see eye to eye, and it was just right, all downhill Candace. from there. And I was I was the golden child of all the bar <laughs> staff, kind of thing. But um. That's- that's helped yeah, with well, the podcast, you know, you got the yin and yang dynamic. Yeah. But, no, Absolutely. Well, I think, um, you know, in, in a lot of things we do, like I'll probably get a bit abstract, a bit, 
intellectual wank that Astro would call it. And Astro is more literal and on the ground. And um, yeah, that dynamic, it does help. Cause I think it was just one of us would, I'd go to out just, you know, in no man's land and Astro would probably go a bit literal as well. Cause <laughs> as you know, deal from what we've learned through the dynamic of books, it's like that story build, that tension and that kind of arc you'd have, and then the kicker. So it's kind of that combination to actually deliver it, deliver a, a lesson, which is, uh, yeah, what we've landed on as well. Yeah. I think, uh, it's rare. Like that's why my buddy and I love doing this. Cause you know, we just riff and like, you know, yeah. talk about some smart stuff, some nonsense. It, it's a good mix. You guys, I don't know if you clicked right out of the gate, but you did start coming back to each other. It was because, how to win friends and influence people, right? I forget who approached whom, but that's what kind of brought you to together. You started kind of talking about books. You got on the same wavelength with what book you want to talk about. And then you just, let's put a mic to this and riff. Was that yeah. kind of the process? Yeah, that's it. So at the bar, it was like, uh, Jonesy was going overseas. Uh, so my first day was his last day. He went overseas for a year. And then we got back a year later. His first day back was my last day because I got fired. Uh, <laughs> and then it was like, uh, not long after that, then we met up at uni. We we're both reading books, like saw each other, like from a, a, across the way. And so we we're both reading books, started talking about books, started talking about podcasts. We sort of both finished uni at the same time, both started full-time jobs in the city at the same time. So we made this like uh, Friday morning uh, breakfast club, which was, I think at the time, just mostly an excuse to invite some girls along to, to talk about it. We, we sort of had some mutual friends. Um, but for, for whatever reason, I don't know what we did, but the girls stopped coming and it just ended up being me and Jonesy. <laughs> so we were just talking about books the whole time. So we were talking about books, we were talking about podcasts. Each. So we thought, well, we're talking about books every week. So let's like try and sync up. Let's both sort of read the same book at the same time so we can talk about it together. And then uh, not long after that, we thought, well, let's, let's record these bad boys. We're doing it anyway, so let's just record it. So the, the, the initial ruse to kind of wing each other i don't know if y'all were like winging each other with these book clubs you know just like let's <laughs> let's get the the girls coming through didn't work fully but at least you two stuck together <laughs> exactly 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 it was like uh at the time it was probably a bit painful when they stopped showing up you get a, a late a late text message 10 minutes into the meeting when no one was there and we thought and then there was some kind of excuse they were mr the train or they were feeling crook or whatever but we thought okay well i guess they, it's just they the got on the now. wrong train to the wrong city <laughs> when, yeah, that's it. And when, <laughs> when it was uh when it was the same excuse three weeks in a row that's when we thought oh there's something going on here <laughs> i think they're not coming back yeah i mean it could have been the books your pace was just too fast they couldn't keep up felt intellectually inferior <laughs> they just dropped out but they all no, stuck that with narrative, it. I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, we'll claim that <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool so you guys started up and from the beginning where you're like all right we'll just keep doing once a week i guess on friday or the weekends whenever you're free and just kind of no goal in mind is just continue doing what we normally do I think, I think early days we might have said, oh, let's just aim for five or 10 or something like that. But once we had momentum, I think we were enjoying it and we just, we just kept on going and uh, yeah, we're having a lot of fun with it. And that was the main thing at the start, assuming no one was listening because essentially no one was listening at the start. And uh, as long as we were having fun and learning as we were doing it and having some kind of upside, then it was well and truly worth our time and effort. Because one of my issues I used to have with books was I'd read a full book and I'd get to the end and be like, what, what the hell was that book? I just wouldn't remember anything from it and I'd like spend 10 hours reading it or something. So I was right, going through the notes and then chatting about it. You know, that every hour almost or every two hours, I'd say, would double the retention on that initial eight hours. So I think that's what the upside of books was at the start for us. Yeah, it kind of happens with, my friend Henry is I'll read the book and do the notes and he'll just kind of read it. And, uh, and then I summarize it for him basically. And he's like, Oh shit, that, <laughs> that was a good book. Uh, so <laughs> like, I guess you're both doing it. So it's a little bit more collaborative, but that's awesome. It's, uh, it's interesting to me too. Cause I, I know, I think I heard a podcast with Ashto about, uh, like kind of being nerdy growing up. I don't know, Jonesy, were you the same? Like, a little bit on the nerdier side of the spectrum or where were you? Uh, what in, in my, I was probably very hardworking and 
disciplined on one side, but I was definitely wasn't nerdy as well. I was a bit of a troublemaker. A uh, lot of alcohol very early on, taking drugs earlier on than most people, getting in fights, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and then, but I'd also have that hard working side. So I think when people, I would win like an academic award or something, and the crowd would start laughing and be like, how the hell is that guy <laughs> winning academic? Isn't he the one who just rocks up the school a little bit hungover or, to, you know? So, yeah, I always had that dichotomy, I thought. And um, right now, I've probably lost the, the bad stuff and hung on to a bit more of the good stuff, probably because of books. Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's funny because the one person named Jonesy I ever knew, he was my neighbor. He had a fucking like a pirate ship in his yard like a, a full-blown like japanese <laughs> vessel and then he'd just smoke a ton like kind of you in the past i guess like a pack a day he'd drink a ton and just tell these stories about sailing the world <laughs> so i just i kind of i'm meshing you with him in my mind it's they're pretty much the same person yeah <laughs> that's a that's reincarnation so yeah it's uh it's cool so you've pretty much kind of i guess channeled more so that that smarter side, you've read some books that kind of help push away maybe the, the bad mm. habits or the destructive habits. And yeah. I think, I think I've, I've always had this like wild, this kind of wild animal kind of energy kind of side in me. And in the past it was directed towards, you know, traveling. And if I'd go traveling, it, it'd be like nine months by myself through the poorest parts of Asia. Or if I went studying or something, uh, rather than just choosing a university that, people have already done i'd go to ankara turkey like right next to syria during the the war in syria or something i just had this energy to kind of explore and adventurous half um which is yeah so when it was channeled there before that it was just channeled in partying and i'd get locked up and all that and more recently it's just through yeah through reading and and more of a side hustle side of things so it's kind of trying to harness that energy for a positive force the adventures are now live vicariously through the books. Not so, not, not so much fiction now, but that's, that's crazy. I don't know. Ashley, were you as much of a, a traveler person or were you just hearing these stories occasionally when Jonesy would come back? Or Yeah, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, mine was definitely a different approach. For me, uh, I, I went to this high school where you had to get a test to get in and it was like just all the, like, all the, all the nerdy kids that get in. Everyone was working really hard. Uh, Everyone was either, you know, at the end of high school, either going on to medicine or law or engineering or something, something hardcore. And there were, at the time, it was like, yeah, this is awesome. But looking back, it's sort of like, we're, we're just learning stuff to pass the test. Um, but I think that was sort of like the, the foundation of, of learning. So now transferring that from how do I learn to get really good grades is more like, okay, how do I read a book to learn the most amount of stuff possible from this book. So I think like that was like a, a good foundation that the nerdiness definitely helped uh, for, for future life. And I think now that like ability to learn and, and go sort of hardcore into that is, is definitely helped. What was weird for me was growing up. I, I think you said this before, Ashton was like, you, you weren't a big fan of like English class reading very much. It felt forced. Mm. Jonesy, maybe similar vibes. But that was for me, like I didn't read until freshman year of college. I read Freakonomics and I'm like, holy shit, when I can pick the book, I love it. Mm. <laughs> it, it literally opened my eyes and now I'm kind of doing the same as you guys just talking about books constantly, consuming constantly. Do you think there's a, like in terms of school and education, is there something that you guys would change if you had kind of the governmental power to, or you ran a school? That's, that's a good a, question. A good tea up. Say. That's a good tee up. We're, we're, um, we're writing a book at the moment. Um, and the, the, the working title is uh, we're going with the shit they never taught you. And so that's pretty much what we're, we're working on at the moment. It's like, okay, what's all the things that we've learned through books that they just never teach you in school? So whether that's you know, basic personal finances or whether that's how do you pick the right job or whether that's how do you uh, progress in your career. It's not just all about skills. It's more about relationships or whether that's how do you start a little side, how sort of make some more money on the side and, and maybe that turns into a full business. It's like all these little things that you're never really exposed to. I think you sort of go through when you're growing up, your, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, they're all in the same sort of realm. They're all doing the same sorts of things. So you're never really exposed 
to anything outside of that. And then, of course, your teachers are in a similar sort of realm as well. So when you, for us, when we were reading hundreds of books, we're exposed to hundreds of different ideas, different approaches to life. Um, so for us, it was that exposure to those, those different ways of doing things that we thought maybe everyone should be exposed to this. Um, of course, no book has all the answers, uh, but it's just like an, an opening your eyes to a different way of doing things. Yeah, it's pretty insane to think like, I remember in high school doing drama class, like I wasn't really interested in drama whatsoever or at the time learning Italian or something like that. And you're spending what, so many hours into that. Then you read a book and it's just like one of the most simplest, highest leverage ideas that you'll ever come across in your whole entire life. It took three pages to read. You're like, why the fuck am I reading this now? Like, you know, mid twenties. Um, if I had this piece of information earlier or if everybody had this, pe- this information earlier, how different they would be and how different the whole entire world would be. Um, so I think that's what is driving us to, to write that book because it is that huge frustration in a sense that it's, it, it should just be taught. That, you know, as, as I said, the shit they should have taught you. Yeah, man, I would have loved... I, I hope you put this out and then it reaches the US audience because I've been or school system. I remember talking about textbooks. I'm like, why the hell are textbooks not like enjoyable to read? And mm. like, I would love mm. the shit they never taught you as my textbook. And it's just like, Oh, here's your kind of like freshman in high school. Here's your book. And then you get the good overview and then maybe you, you can choose extracurriculars based off that or whatever. Yeah. And that's another, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say another back to your original question on, what we change. I think the big difference is, uh, you know, intrinsic motivation. So like right now you're choosing something and you're in control of what you're trying to learn. So I don't know what the solution would be, but I think the question would be, how do you make students and kids intrinsically motivated to go after what they want? And it's a little bit similar to whatever their unique curiosities are somehow related closer to that and, through that they'll be driven mm. more and they're going to be much more relevant in the workforce in future and it's a lot more fun i mean you want to have fun at school it's just a it's a it's a real shame that people are just not enjoying their time at school and then that translates to work people aren't enjoying their time at work it's kind of yeah it's kind of crazy i remember I, i'd always stress because we have socratic seminars on whatever book we were supposed to read in english class and i, I just crammed the spark notes i wish i had your podcast because you pretty much covered everything that well <laughs> not so much the iliad I don't think but, uh, <laughs> like I, I would love that. I think it's uh, it's just not here yet, but hopefully you can push that book out. I know I saw like you had the book. There was something on Amazon, like the book about books or something. And I'm like, Oh, are they going to finally put out a book? Do you have like a, a timeline for when people can expect this? Cause that that's going to be a game changer. I'll give you, I'll give you a peek behind the curtain. We started back in, uh, in January. So we started, started uh, 10 months ago or so where we, we thought, okay, uh, we've got this thing called the, our top 50 best books of all time, which we did a couple of years ago where we ranked our, our favorite 50 books and like a paragraph on each uh, and people downloaded it. It's been like something super popular that we've done where lots of people have grabbed it. So we thought, okay, what's the next version of this? What's like a, we can just update it from year to year, but let's go like a bigger version. So we went from 50 to hundred. So our top hundred books. And we went from like a paragraph on each to like a couple of pages on each. So we, we sort of both wrote a thousand words each on a hundred different books. So we had uh, like a hundred thousand words of these ranked from a hundred down to number one, uh, which was sort of like the first version of the book. And then uh, we, we sent it out to, you know, 10 or 15 listeners to get a bit of feedback on different sections And there was sort of two unanimous pieces of feedback. The first was saying uh, it's good, but it's a bit dry. It's sort of like a bit, um, you know, summary style, whereas the podcast is a bit more life. Like we inject a bit more of our own personality into it. So the first uh, evolution was evolving from just like a summary to like the podcast style where we tell a few of our own stories, try and make a few gags as well. And then the second evolution was uh, grouping the ideas together. So someone who likes, the four-hour work week might not necessarily like guns, germs, and steel, or somebody who likes a brief history of time might not necessarily like uh, Lynchpin by Seth Godin. So we thought, okay, well, how can we group these? Because our order was just a random order of what we thought was best to worst. We thought, okay, let's try and group these together. So then we grouped them in terms of like 
what are all the best marketing books? What are the three marketing books that we can group together? Um, or what are the three personal finance books that we can group together? So now that the, the newest version, which is like our third or third or fourth rewrite and the final rewrite of which we're about halfway through as we speak right now is, uh, is we've got those groups. So we've got like sections. So we've got like a personal development section, a career section, a business section. Uh, and then within each of those sections, we've got different parts. So we've got like within business, you've got like getting ideas. You've got like making products. You've got like, okay, when, when times are going tough, how do you get through? that we've got marketing and then within each of those is like the the three or four best books in those in those categories so that's what we're working on at the moment that's where we'll uh we'll get to very very soon i love that blend of kind of textbooky so you can go in whatever area you want and then just go completely in depth and subcategories there kind of like the tribe of mentors tools of titans but with books rather than people maybe Mm. um not not exactly the same i guess but it is cool uh I'm excited for that. I don't know. You said you're halfway through, so hopefully 2020 still that, that thing will come out. Uh, tw- I'd say 2021. 2021. Oh, early 2021. You, Parkinson's Law, you got to embrace it. Just uh, <laughs> let it rip. But that's awesome. So hopefully, uh, you know, get some younger people to listen. I don't know exactly the demographics for your audience, but it'd be, I'm not sure. Do you have like a, a younger audience too, or is it mostly like 20s, maybe 30s in that range? Yeah, I'd say the majority, I think uh, the way it splits it up on our Spotify stats is like, so I think 28 to 35 is the most. And then uh, and then the majority after that would be younger on the younger side. And then older women as well. There's, it kind of spikes <laughs> up. <laughs> hey, you know, it came back, the, the book club. They, they all come back. <laughs> <laughs> We're just too early. We're like 20 years too early on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe we target the wrong demographic, Asher, for our, uh, exactly. our morning breakfast. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, so yeah, I guess uh, you'll have to tell their their younger siblings or or their kids to uh, you know <laughs> pass it down the generational line. But that's awesome. So you guys, you're intrinsically motivated, kind of like we wish more kids were. Maybe some gamification is needed to get people involved, but. Uh, the same for us that's why i love doing podcasts but you didn't get an actual guest like i don't know if you were from day one thinking like oh we'll talk about these books and maybe one day we'll get authors on what was that because i know you kind of read the four hour work week and and tried to outsource that i think his name was daniel or whoever the (laughs) the guy was but you try to have him just send out like a hundred emails and you weren't getting much action uh, what was that like? Were you feeling dejected or were you just like, you know what, screw it. Like, we'll just keep talking to each other the whole time. Yeah, it was definitely, um, part of it. We didn't start from the very, very start looking for guests, but we definitely started within a couple of months and it wasn't, it took us months to get the first guest. I think it was like seven months before we, uh, eventually got our first guest. Uh, and as you said, that wasn't from lack of trying. We're trying to, how can we do this? We're two blokes with no name like we're just nobodies we just started just finished uni just started in the in the workforce we started this podcast no one was really listening to it so we had no cred or anything and we're just trying to work out how can we actually get people to say yes to coming on the show so we tried a a whole bunch of different things we had these email scripts it's kind of cringeworthy to go back to (laughs) some of our um some of our old email templates that we had sending out like uh invitation to inspire thousands and like uh (laughs) we'd have in there like some like we had like oh yeah we've we've had um you know 50 downloads or something like something like that where it was like at the very very start we thought that was (laughs) that was awesome um but yeah so it was very cringeworthy we and we thought okay well us sending these out, it's just not working. We got to, it's just a numbers game. We're going to have to increase the volume here. So we got um, Daniel from Kenya. Uh, I think he was on three or four bucks an hour to just like, um, just like basically change the name and the book title in each, in each email we sent out. I think we eventually sent out like 50 and we got one person say yes, Matthew Michael, which he, he was our first guest um, about seven months in. And then, okay. So we're like, okay, we've got one. Surely that will mean we can get more now. So he sent out another 50. We got maybe two or three. He sent out another 50. We got like three or four. So eventually the strike rate was improving. So then once we had some, some guests on there, we could start to name drop a little bit. 
uh, we could start to we could start to say, okay, this person, this person, and this person have been on before. So we sort of started to improve our strike rate, and then we got like a few bigger names. So we got like some bigger Australian guests, like some people off Shark Tank Australia, um, and then we got like Seth Godin was probably the first really big one that sort of then helped unlock the next three or four after that, and. Gradually over time, our email got better, our credibility got better, um, and we could name drop a bit more. So we could slowly, slowly start getting more and more people. And by now we've had like, um, you know, some of our favorite authors of all time. And then just one, one extra side note, Daniel was good, but then he started posting random posts on our website about boner pills and penis enlargement and like <laughs> yeah. post all this random spammy shit. I think he was working for someone else right. and trying to, I don't know what he was doing, but uh, we thought, okay, see you, Daniel. <laughs> That's enough. Well, well I got Daniel on, um, <laughs> well, you might've heard in an episode. Uh, Daniel was also the dude who was running my Tinder when I was single at the time. So, you know, after the four hour work week, you are pretty inspired to go out there and uh, see what you can outsource what monotonous tasks you're doing to outsource. And at the time, Tinder was a lot, very laborious work to try and <laughs> land dates. I've got Daniel um, helping me out on that. So he was writing to all the, and trying to get matches and all that. <laughs> and then again, he, he went, he was great. And then he, he went into, uh, he started saying, I'm restless to all the, to all the, the, the females out there. And like, what does restless mean? And then, um, you know, it didn't work out well. And, Perhaps I shouldn't have outsourced my uh, my dating like that. Well, you might have <laughs> caused that actually, Jonesy, because you know he started getting into the dating world. Next thing you know, he's on penis enlargement sites. And <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> I've seen a bit of correlation causation. Here. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> it could point. be. Uh, could be on you, but uh, it all <laughs> comes back to that. Actually, that's funny because four hour work week changed my whole perspective. That's we partly have a team editing like the video on this, the transcripts, everything, and uh, and the. I used to work for a dating company actually. So we kind of were in this world and we had people that would just pay like three, four bucks an hour to just have someone in the Philippines or wherever swipe. And so it's just funny it's seeing so people adapt it. It's, it's just crazy what's possible in the world. Uh, I know that's a bit of a tangent. But, um, so y'all kind of embraced the four hour work week, uh, had some success, not quite when you had 50 downloads, but you kind of built on guess right after you got your first one was that your approach to growth because podcast is traditionally a, a hard place to grow do you think it's more so the guest that brought it, or was it just you guys being consistently putting out good content and stuff like that i'd say it'd be yeah consistency absolutely at the start and just just discipline and just slogging away at it over a long time i think the metaphor of the uh the flywheel is quite pertinent to how our podcast went at the very start, it's real slog to start spinning the flywheel. But once you're up and running, the momentum carries itself and it just uh, keeps on growing. So slogging it, but then also adopting a bit of anti-fragility. So constant, like kind of constant changes and tweaks as our podcast went. So at the very start, I think it was a good idea to start doing our songs and doing being very crass and, a lot more swear words at the start, like a lot, because we kind of just do swear a lot of this, uh, you know, naturally, but over time kind of crafting that and cutting and improving and everything like that. Um, and, you know, even this year, we're still making, made a pretty big change at the start of the year to just change the, the sound, overall sound of the podcast and, and stuff like that. So I think our attitude is to always be t making tweaks because as soon as you stop tweaking, uh, I think podcasts kind of stop him improving if you think about the i'm also a big fan of tim ferris but i think because because he reached the top at the very start his podcast hasn't really changed much i feel like because he reached the top at the very start whereas if you're actually constantly trying to build and grow um there is room for improvement and you got nothing to lose he, he started because yeah, i remember exactly. you talk about how he'd have to get drunk because he was so nervous because he already had the audience whereas y'all mm -hmm. y'all could just you know, rap at the end, just go off any <laughs> tangent you want, start swearing, drink, whatever it is, uh, you can do that more liberally. Mm. And I guess what's interesting, maybe it's, I don't know if it's like your competitive advantage now, but what would you say separates you from like any other book podcast? Is it your little dynamic together where you guys just vibe well and people get along with that? Or like what really separates you from most other book summary podcasts? 
I think that's an important question to ask for and like for ourselves to continually um, keep trying to check in on. I think uh, at the start we were very much like, okay, let's just let's just focus on the lessons. Um, and, and in fact, at the start we were like, oh man, these stories are so these stories are so shit. Let's just like scrap out all the stories and give the lessons. Um, but then you then we sort of realized that the whole reason we like the book is because like you go on the journey to almost uncover the lesson yourself so that it really sticks. If you just get like smacked with the lesson, um, it doesn't really mean too much. So we're trying to, trying to sort of craft the right balance between education and entertainment. Um, I think for us, that means that we don't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, it means like we take the piss out of each other mostly and also the piss out of ourselves. Um, but the books are very serious themselves, but we're trying to do it in a way that we're not like the experts telling everybody, Hey, this is what you got to do. This is the answer. It's more like here, we're going on the journey as well. We're, we're trying to learn. We're curious. We're trying to understand the world. And we're just like, almost like sharing our own learnings along the way, rather than saying, Hey, we've mastered it all. Try and come from us. We're the gurus. I, I, I repetitively, or I repeatedly hear that where it's, Hey, just kind of learn in public or build in public or do whatever. And it just starts from this curiosity of, Hey, we're trying to learn. We're not the experts here. And then, you know, you, people kind of that authenticity people resonate with. And clearly that's, the, that's the case here. So, I mean, you guys have basically interviewed so many people, read so many books. When, when we're talking about interviews, how is your actual process changed because i know that first one you guys were like it was it's a little bit rough around the edges and uh like do you prepare differently than you used to or i guess we'll start with that question like do you prepare differently for those interviews yeah absolutely so the very start we i don't i think we just had a pen and paper and we didn't do a hell of a lot and then it, it kind of fell flat and the interviews really sucked then i think we went very far the other way on the pendulum of over preparing to the point where things were scripted and uh, we wouldn't be listening to what they're saying. We're kind of just like waiting for them to stop and then we just ask the next question on our list. And uh, because we weren't really present in the moment, I think with two hosts, it was difficult because if we weren't, if we were focusing on what we were going to say next, I think I was worse than Asha on this. I might jump in mid when someone's halfway through their spiel and they haven't done their, their release or something, or I'd jump over Ashto. And so I think when we were too prepared like that, that was bad. And then I think over time we've kind of iterated to the point now we would over prepare beforehand, but then also kind of let it go and just have that in the back of the mind and just see where the conversation goes and have a bit more fluidity about it and be a bit more relaxed and um, open and, improv a lot more than we did at the start. Yeah. I, I don't know if you guys, uh, maybe Jonesy, cause you're super into Tim Ferriss too. Um, uh, Kyle Fussman. I, I like his approach. I think, um, actually who wrote the game? What's his name? Uh, Neil Strauss. Neil, Neil yeah. Strauss. Yeah. Like he, I don't know which one of them, maybe they both do this, but basically they prepare all their questions, like do heavy research and then tear it all up and just vibe and chat. And I think, that's more or less the direction you guys went. Is that what you're, you're saying? Yeah, I'd say that yeah. not to the point of uh, tearing up. Maybe we should burn the boats, right? Like that's a good analogy because <laughs> then you got no option other than to be fully present in the moment. I think if it's on zoom, most of our interviews have been on zoom. Yeah, it is. It is still lurking in the background a lot of the time. And we'd also have a, the other thing we added into our interviews was me and Asher would have a pen. So whoever's holding the pens, asking the, the next question, <laughs> typically <laughs> just because you put it up a little hand wave. Hmm. Yeah. I guess you guys took the more friendly duo system versus just kicking your one of you guys off. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's different approaches, I guess. Uh, I feel your pain, what, Dylan. If, you, uh, <laughs> if you're doing all the all the preparation and all that, and then uh, the, then he asks a stupid <laughs> question. I'm like, dude, I, that's the first thing you'd read on Wikipedia. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, ridiculous! That's, that's awesome. It's it's hard to manage different directions of uh, of thought, especially when one's super basic. So that's cool. 
that you guys uh, have figured it out. With these authors that clearly have had a million podcast interviews, is that in the back of your head? Like, how can I find a different angle? Uh, ask them questions that maybe they haven't heard. Like, are, are you doing anything special there? I think the I think the more we've gone on, the more we've gone towards that. Definitely at the start, it was very much like, um, okay, we've read this book. Here's like the extra three things we want to ask off the back of the book. There was nothing really special that we did after that. Now we're trying to think of more so how does this book apply to the real world or like what are some more actionable things that we can take away from the book? But then also like some bigger, broader applications. So like I think probably the one of the best ones we did recently was Simon Sinek. Um, he's got a book called The Infinite Game where he's talking about, you know, some people are thinking finite game. They're thinking win-lose. They're thinking short-term. But business and life is really a long-term thing. It's, a, it's an infinite thing. There's no winner or loser. It's just you're constantly trying to play the game. Um, so that was like a very abstract thing. And we actually spoke to him like in March 2020 just when – coronavirus was shutting down the whole world so it was like perfectly timed so it was almost like how does the infinite game apply to coronavirus so i think that was like probably the just like the perfect timing and the perfect application of a book to a real world current event type of thing so i think that was probably the the best example of something where we've been uh asking new and different questions that sort of challenge them a little bit yeah i I watched that it seemed like the the time zones in the beginning was tricky there. And uh, he <laughs> I think it was like 3 a.m. or something for us. So, yeah. yeah it was crazy. And he was somehow tired at like whatever time it was here. Uh, that what's interesting to me, cause that was a video form, but typically you guys don't do video. Is there a reason for that? You want to keep it simple or what's the rationale? Cause your backgrounds are dope right now. It looks better than mine. So it definitely looked good. For the interviews, uh, we we didn't consciously do that. I think we we will from now on for any Zoom call we have. It just makes sense. It's very easy to just whack up on on YouTube. In terms of the actual podcasts uh, as videos, we we did for a little bit. We tried having video at the same time, but I think and we tried doing little minute, little uh, four or five minute YouTube kind of videos. Um, but that didn't just didn't really work. I don't think video resonates with us as well uh, as it would with other. YouTube is so much. I think oh, audio is... female audience just fled. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the older females, those podcasts. spikes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think audio is more in our wheelhouse for sure than, than, uh, than, than visual as our core thing. And now we've also got a, an editor on board for our audio stuff. So if we had it on video, we don't really just go off for one take anymore like we did at the very start. Um, which would be you know, a bit of a pain in the ass if we're doing yeah, a video of that. What are you editing out? Uh, I'd say when we, 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 we want to be as dense as possible with our podcast. So sometimes we might, uh, we put a lot of effort into how much story and how much kicker we put in, in preparation and also making sure we get the author's in, intent right. So if, say, Ash show says something i'm like nah i don't think that's what she really meant when she was writing this book or something i'd actually pull our show up and say hang on is that is that right and then we might chat about it and then we go, all right let's just go back into it kind of thing um so little things like that just making sure we're delivering the content and the, the lesson especially in the best possible way but also not cutting out so much that the entertainment values dropped and we've still got spontaneity as well so it's a it's a balance we're yeah. always trying to keep <clears throat> I think part of it was at the very start, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. So it was literally a 20 minute episode meant 22 minutes of work. It meant hit start, uh, as in hit record, talk for 20 minutes, hit stop, save it, upload it. That was, that was job done. Um, and I think that was perfect to get us started because uh, it, allowed us, it allowed it to be easy and that we could just do it without too much effort. And then we like gradually stepped it up little by little um, until the point where now it's like we've got, we're doing tens of hours of work for each episode in terms of reading, in terms of prepping notes, back and forth, editing those notes, discussing it beforehand, and then going through. And if we if we don't nail something, we might do another take of that of that specific lesson or something like that, and then editing it down. So now it's like if it, if the very start you're like it's going to take you a combined thirty hours a week, 
would have been like, no, thanks. But because at the start, it was just like 22 minutes. It was like, oh yeah, we can do that. We can do that. And then gradually over time, stepped it up little by little until the point where now it's like, we can really put some serious effort into it without being intimidated by it. Yeah. I think, uh, we started, geez, we started the same way. Whereas like, you know, just 22 minutes, just riffing and then slowly you want to step it up. And now we're like, God damn the amount of time that goes into this, but you're, you're, mm. you're too deep in the game. Like the, <laughs> the momentum's there. You guys have an audience of, I'm, I'm sure tens of thousands listening to every episode. So there's some pressure behind you. I, mm. Luckily, like, well, what are you going to say? Ash, or Jonesy, sorry. Yeah, I think, I think you kind of have to now because it's podcasts are scalable. Like if you think about 50 years ago in your local town, if you were the best presenter at the local town hall or something, then, uh, it was pretty easy to gather people, but today all of us, we're competing with the best in the very world in what they're doing. So uh, we're competing with Joe Rogan, we're competing with Tim Ferriss. So it's a very competitive game and it's kind of winner takes all uh, because it is scalable. So I think if if you're really looking to build an, an audience that's that's very big, then I think you have to go to that amount of effort and really be the best in in whatever niche you are, because if you're not the best in your niche, then why the hell would anybody waste their time listening to you? They can just go to the very best for no extra effort. Even if it's a local town in, I don't know, Brazil or something, it <laughs> doesn't matter. Is that your main goal at this point is just have the highest quality podcast or do you have any vision for going from, I think you're a little, I don't know exactly how many, like 3 million plus downloads like how do you get to that next level from where you guys are now is it just improving the the quality of the actual podcast itself i kind of wish we i kind of wish we knew the answer like we uh we started with probably four listeners and those were probably me jonesy my mom and jonesy's mom um and then like slowly slowly built up from there um I think like each time we've done a little improvement, whether that was new mics or we started working off the same notes or we started doing an extra conversation of preparation beforehand, each time we've done that, like the quality has improved a bit and the audience has improved a bit. Um, and then like at the start, the guests episodes, we're getting more downloads than our normal book episodes, but now it's sort of totally flipped in that our book episodes probably get 40% more downloads than um, interview guest episode. So we actually haven't really done an, an interview for about six months because we sort of slowed down on the interviews just because people are more interested in us now than in the guests. Um, so for us, we don't really know the secrets to growth, unfortunately, because if we knew, we'd just keep doing that. Um, but I think so our only proxy for that is to just make the best quality stuff and I hope it resonates with people. Try to find, okay, well, what what books are people liking the most? What styles are people liking the most? How can we tweak little things to make little improvements as we go? And hopefully that that means um, that means growth. I guess the other part of that is for us, like, uh, there's so many things you can do. And like, if you if you read blog posts about how to grow a podcast, there'll be, you know, post on Instagram, post on Twitter, do a video version, do a highlights version, uh, you know, get on LinkedIn, do all this, all do all this promotion, run some paid ads. There's like so many ways that people are saying to grow a podcast. But for us, it was sort of like, okay, well, we could do another 30 hours of work just on the marketing promotion side. There's so many things we could do. But we thought, okay, well, what's actually what's actually possible for us to do? What can we actually do within that week to make it, again, not so intimidating that we just think this is too hard. We've got to give up. What's the bare minimum, I guess, that we can do? Um, and how can we sort of systematize that a bit to, to do, do the bare minimum that doesn't overwhelm us? Yeah, it, it is interesting you point out like the guess in the beginning, that's what's going to get people to click. And now they're so bought into you. Like people just listen for Joe Rogan as for the personality side. But mm -hmm. uh, I do think the nice thing about, I guess, well, Zoom, are you guys normally in person or right now are you like you can't be in person? At the moment, we can't. Hopefully, hopefully tomorrow that changes. Um, hopefully, but, but basically, it's actually been a, um, a good period to force us to change the way we do it. So before we'd record every single week together in person. Now it's, we've been sort of like batching. So we've been doing, you know, four episodes in a weekend and then have three weeks off type of thing. So it's been, a, it's been good to force us to do new things like that. Jesus Christ. So you, you'll read four books and you'll just take notes over four weeks and then just have a, a gnarly weekend. Once, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I remember Tim Ferriss, he would say he batches his podcast on like Mondays and Fridays or something. I forget the dates, but uh, like I'm too introverted. I'll just fucking talk. I get sapped <laughs> and I'm like, I'm out for the count. So that's, uh, that's impressive that you guys can, can batch it. I remember you talking about how in this period when you have quarantines, like it's nice to have some reserve kind of uh, mm. the seem to have like a uh, mentality mm. of preparing I think for it, stuff. Uh, I think mm-hmm. I think it also depends on the the book. Like some, if we are doing like a Nassim Taleb book, that probably takes you out a full day, and <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of a Taleb book. There is a lot of stop starting actually for something like that compared to easy books. We could just do it in one take. Um, so you know, is it system one which is slow thinking? System sorry, system, system two is slow thinking. Yeah. Dep- so if I, there's a lot of slow thinking yeah. in the book, we know there's going to be. It, it, it's a finite resource that you're going to be cooked by lunchtime. So uh, yeah, it depends on what book we can is how much we can batch. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I think I'll fall asleep. Like I can't physically read anymore. I just can't do it. I'm only auditory on like two and a half times speed. I'm taking notes at the same time, which works well mm-hmm. for ripping through a lot, but you guys have stayed very uh traditional in terms of physical books like you like taking notes do you have any process that uh maybe most people don't do when they're reading books yeah i think for me it's it's almost the the opposite to you in that i i can't uh like a digital book like if i was reading on a kindle or something it just doesn't have the same effect and then i think because i listen to so many podcasts uh and it's almost like background type of listening it's not fully active listening that just listening to a book, I don't think I'd have the same effect either. I think it's just when I'm physically holding the paper book in my hands with a pencil and doing some scribbles is when I, I retain the most. Um, so for me, it just means as I'm reading, I'm highlighting bits and, or making notes, uh, whether that's like at the start of the chapter, I'll, I'll sort of jot down the most important lessons from that part or whether it's just putting a box or a circle around certain areas or just one or two words to try and prompt me later um, when I go through it. So that's when I'm reading the book and then going back through the book, again, going from cover to cover, looking for my notes, trying to put them into different um, it, digitally, like typing them into like a mind mapping thing and then moving those different chunks around to try and get the best episode flow. That's sort of my, my note taking um, for that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes like I'll like write a scribble, which at the time I'm like, yeah, I'll remember that later. These two words will be enough to prompt me. And then I'll just look at it. I'm like, I've got no idea what that means. So then you've got to re- reread that whole section again. But uh, most, of the time, most of the time it works pretty well. Jonesy, your process is pretty similar too in terms of mind mapping and taking notes that way. Yeah, same thing. So we'll go through the notes and then I'd use one note. Uh, Astro, more the mind mapping style. So I'd just, yeah, just rearrange from, from one note. And then just to take uh, it a bit further where we combine into the episode then. So we'd pull it into the one document. And then from there, someone will do the, someone's the role of writing all the raw notes for the episode. The other person's got the role of the piggybacker, we call it. And the piggybacker goes in and then adds their two cents to the notes, rearranges it. And then the person who was originally writing the notes would go in and rearrange it again kind of thing and have different suggestions and, We'd have things in red zone, which are a full cut orange zone, which is a maybe. And in the episode, when we go up to an orange notes, looking at, oh, we just, we just, you know, might do the quick version of that or something like that. Um, and then we we hit record. Y'all sound like the the healthiest friendship I've ever heard. I don't know how you manage <laughs> to work so well together, but it's it's inspiring i mean i i think that's part of the problem because i was talking with a friend from school who wanted to do podcasts and he's like Mm -hmm. i just don't have a buddy i vibe with like say you and henry or you two like do you think that's fundamental to someone starting like say someone wants to start a podcast just because it's easy they're already consuming content like do you need uh, a partner in crime like you have to to really make it successful Absolutely. I think uh, in our case, there's no way we could do it by ourselves. I think the key for our working relationship has been, we call, uh, <laughs> he's not going to listen to this podcast, but we call it, <laughs> we call it gilly, gilly attack sessions, right? I've got a mate called, called Gilly. I should have just, I should have made up a different name. <laughs> but anyway, right? I was, I was living with him and uh, there was a lot of unconscious tension that, 
we had and we'd never bring it up. And then he just explode one day. <laughs> um, there's a lot of just unconscious, you know, that feeling. So we kind of had these gilly attack sessions where whoever's feeling that tension for whatever reason, uh, both of us want them to let the gilly out. So gilly's turned into a verb. He used to be a real person's name. <laughs> I think that's, um, that's really key. It's kind of, Oh, that kid's book, right? Like there's no such thing as a dragon. The dragon starts very small. Billy Beans not looking at this tiny, tiny dragon. The more the kid doesn't look at the dragon, the bigger the dragon grows. And then all of a sudden the dragon's overtaking the whole house. And I think that is a good metaphor for a lot of yeah relationships, working relationships. And you want to point out the dragon or the gilly as soon as you possibly can to make it shrink. And then you can, uh, then you're probably better off for whatever that, conflict was at the very start yeah i think if anyone learned something from your podcast other than the books it's just like hey how to how to be good friends like literally the gilly stuff i was thinking i don't know if y'all have heard of gilly suits before do you know what those are no oh god damn it's perfect it's perfect analogy so gilly suit (laughs) is like if you see a sniper they'll put like bushes and grass all over them it's the suit it's called a gilly suit so you're hiding. No. It's basically like you don't see it and then it pops up and fucking kills you. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Man, that's, there you that, go. that fits so well. well I'm not <laughs> talking about my mate Maybe, there. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about... Uh, <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> you don't have to throw you made gilly under the bus anymore. Yeah, no, I don't. I can actually use the word gilly as well in public. <laughs> Thank God. Jeez. Is he, uh, have you told him like you, get, you just got to bring it out in the open and <laughs> reformed him or is he a lost cause at this point? He's a bit of a he's a bit of a lost <laughs> cause, to be honest. He's a great dude. He's like lovely dude. We are good mates, but uh, some people, you know, everyone's got different types. Some mates you're just good mates with. You have beers with. We play chess together, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'd say the majority of people in the world don't have the emotional maturity to actually have conversations where you can bring up conflict in a very good way. In my normal work, in my normal jobs, I've never. Hmm. It's, I've never really had that opportunity to have that conflict in, in positive ways in the normal world, even though it's, I think, one of the most important things for uh, any kind of successful organization. Because then if you, don't, if you don't let it out, then it just simmers beneath the surface in passive aggressive back and forth emails, uh, f- trying to throw each other under the bus instead of really letting it out and airing it out. Normally, like when you let the gilly out, you realize like it wasn't that big a deal anyway. Um, but uh, it's it isn't if like if you're holding it in and keeping it in, it really it really boils away and it really grows. Um, and I think often like uh, the not to not your mate Gilly, but in most in most situations, like you could be mates during the uh, a normal you know a normal normal times, but then when you put under the the microscope or put under pressure, like when Jonesy was living with Gilly, or if you go on an overseas trip together or something, like that's when the the pressure's really on. That's when the cracks can really start to appear. You know, like normally if you just see him for an hour or two a week, um, you're never going to realize the the underlying tension there. That's like, <clears throat> geez, like I heard this. Uh this advice before you get married is travel the world for a year with the person you're thinking about. And it's like that, that pressure is going to reveal all the cracks in your <laughs> yeah, That's it. That's uh, sink or swim. Yeah. I think that's like my friend when I basically kicked him off the podcast, I'm like, dude, you suck. <laughs> you, you fucking don't do your research. You're trash. Just get off the podcast. And he's like, all right. Yeah. Like I understand. So it's just, that honesty and it's it's always a joke with us but like the point gets across and it sounds like it's just a similar approach with you guys uh yeah how how do you bring that to guess because that's one thing i've been wrestling with too is like we have a good dynamic together but now you bring a guest on you don't really know them very well like can you shoot the shit with them in any way or is it like does it feel like there's that kind of tension or just like it, it doesn't feel natural for you I think the best ones are when we're in person. If we're in person face-to-face, it makes it easier. Um, and it, it makes it easier to just have that 10 minutes before you start um, to sort of warm up rather than just like starting and, and then trying to build the rapport as you go. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, something we're still working on, um, something that we're just trying to work out the best way to do it. Mm, yeah, I don't I think, really have an answer. And I think on, from their perspective on Zoom, say if they are a a pretty big time author, if you put their hat on, I feel like they, a lot of the time just want to kind of get into it. 
and I'm sure there's a lot of like every podcaster wants to build rapport in them. So I think it's kind of trying to work out when they jump on, do they just want to get straight into it? And if that's the case, also being respectful of their time and just saying, all right, this is just a podcast. They just want to get out in front of people, uh, their, their ideas. And the goal of that isn't for us to become good mates and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's as much as we'd love to be good friends with <laughs> all the, <laughs> I got, I got one funny. I got one funny story. Well, I guess like we sort of thought there's two sort of two sort of mistakes we've made. One mistake is thinking these guys are the 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 big dogs and we're just nobody. So let's not let's not stand in their way. So I think that's a mistake if you think too far that way. The biggest mistake I made was going too far the other way, where we're going to a bloke's place. Um, I don't know if I should name drop him or not. Is, is, name is, it. He didn't. <laughs> his name was Peter Fitzsimons. He's just this Aussie. He wrote a book called The Great Aussie Slim Down or something. He does a whole bunch of history books. And um, he's, uh, I think he used to play rugby. Um, and he, uh, he's on TV and stuff. And he's like a bit of a larrikin. He's a bit of a loud mouth. But he seems like, I thought he was a bit of a legend. Um, he seems like he's always taking the piss out of people. And I thought that was just his character. And we were going to his house to record this podcast. And I, I think I said to Jonesy, it was like a Sunday, like 5 p.m. or something. And I said, I think we're going to get along really well. Should we like bring three steaks in case he wants to cook as a barbecue afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the expectations I was going in with. I was thinking, this guy's like, we're going to have beers afterwards. We're gonna, he's going to cook us up some steaks on his barbie. We're going to be hanging out. We're going to be loving it. And then we got there. And he was probably one of the biggest douchebags I've ever met because he, he, he sat in his chair, just like, just sat back like this. And, uh, and the, the, the mic cables that we've got are only like a meter long. And so we couldn't, from the, the, the seats, we couldn't actually reach him. And so we're like, oh, can you come a bit closer? And like, you just like, like move like maybe one centimeter closer. Um, so the only way to get him to actually get to the mic was we had to like move and sit on the floor like one meter away from him so we're sitting on the floor and he's like sitting up in the big king chair with his mic so anyway there was this my expectation was we we're gonna have steaks with him and the reality was we were just sitting on the floor like little peasants so that was like uh, the two extremes that we've stuffed up along the way and what's interesting is i'm sure he's not the highest profile person you've talked to so no probably the lowest uh, in all honesty <laughs> He didn't, he didn't make it onto the pot. We didn't even release the episode. No, um, we just deleted that recording. <laughs> it's gone. And then went, went back and ate three steaks instead of two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Had one and a half each, thankfully. What, uh, what was having Dan Ariely, uh, Ariely like in person? Because I know he came down to Sydney and you were able to, to just shoot the shit and uh, you know, bring some cheap wine to his hotel, you know, go to the ballet, have some uh, kebabs like... What was that actually like hanging out with someone where you read their book and maybe put them on a pedestal in person? Are they, is this person different at least? Is Dan different? Absolutely. You couldn't have more pol- polar opposites between yeah. characters <laughs> at all. Right? Like, and Dan Ariely, Dan Ariely is like a legit high status person. The other bloke is just like a C grade celebrity in Australia. So if anyone has the right to treat us like peasants, it would have been Ariely, but... <laughs> Like straight away, it was, yeah, quite the opposite and just shows um, how to treat people, like anyone of any kind of status, everyone are just human beings. And we bought this, we thought it was expensive, well, for us at the time, it was expensive wine, <laughs> a 20, 20 buck bottle of red, but straight away, he just like kind of sniffed it and just shook his head. <laughs> he shook his head? <laughs> but, he, but, he, but he kept drinking it anyway and then... Uh, uh. I uh, had a kebab. We we actually loaded up the bank accounts, saved up a bit for you know, three or four hundred bucks. We thought we we're going to have a right, we're going to shout him for a very nice dinner, and he pointed out the kebabs probably after the red wine. Like these blokes don't have a lot of cash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want you to sleep in the floor for the next month. <laughs> <laughs> kebab with extra uh, cheese, and that's all. That's all we got. But uh, we we're all all on the same level, and it was a real privilege to actually speak to him. He's just on another another level, really of. Uh, of, of thought and he was very curious in us equally as curious in us ironically as we were in him so it was a really good dynamic what's it like to not be able to I afford good wine sorry <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't i couldn't believe that he uh agreed to come with us to the ballet like it was it was almost like a 
it was like something that we emailed through, like we'd booked in the time for the interview and we, we organized to do it at his, his hotel when he was staying in Sydney. Um, and so we flew up to, to go do it. And it was almost like an afterthought, like, oh, should we just like throw this out there? I'm like, surely he's not going to say yes, will he? Like if we invite him to come to the ballet with us for three hours afterwards, but we sent it off and he said, yeah, let's do it. I was like, I was, out, I was just blown away. I was shocked. He's probably got nothing going on in Sydney. He's like just showing up in his hotel room. He's probably going to drink better wine, but company is probably better than that. In the I, I think that's so cool. And it speaks to the networking within podcasting, within just like shooting your shot. I mean, you guys were just, uh, you and Daniel, we're all shooting off emails and uh, it, it just pays. And it's mind blowing to me that more people don't do it. Like, why do y'all think that it is still pretty rare for people to actually do a podcast and just open up their opportunities like you guys have. I think the I think like the, the technical side of a podcast is like quite easy in a sense that you, if you've got a laptop and you can download some free software, you might, your laptop's already got a mic built into it. So technically you just need to hit record, talk, hit stop. That's a, that's like how you actually make a podcast. Very, very easy. The, the hardest part is, I guess the, the more emotional side of it, like the, the fear that comes with it. Oh, my voice, no one's going to like the sound of my voice. Oh, I don't have anything smart to say. Oh, nobody's going to want to listen. People are going to tease me. People are going to hang shit on me. I think that's the hard part about making the podcast. And, and often it's, um, people might start and get five, six, seven episodes in and then realize, oh, this is, this is too much work. And that's when they give up. So I think like starting a podcast and technically recording a podcast is quite easy. The hard part is getting over those fears and then keep going once you get started to actually keep going. I think that's probably why most people don't do it is because it, it's bloody scary at the start. Yeah. I think what helps is when you can lean on each other too. You're like, you know, we're having a good time. Like, fuck it. Let's, let's keep doing it. Our moms Big like time. it or at least pretend to like it. Like, <laughs> let's keep ripping. Pretend in our case. Then, <laughs> yeah. Several hundred episodes in. I'm curious is, is there anything, I guess, Ashley, you mentioned just a couple of things you did wrong. Is there anything that you do differently looking back? Because it's been four plus years. How, how many? Yeah, you got five yeah, years. Four and a half years, yeah. Jeez. Like, is there anything that you would do differently uh, since you, you were able to get started? You didn't really fear uh, people too much looking back that maybe would change your trajectory in a positive direction? Or more um, positive. You, you've been successful. I don't mean to qualify it like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't really think so. I think like all the things we know now, of course, if we did them at the start, that would be a lot better. But really the only way we got to doing it now is by going through it the way we did. Like, as I said, if we started from saying, okay, hey, let's commit to doing 30 hours a week and let's commit to paying an editor and let's commit to um, buying this expensive equipment and stuff like that, we probably wouldn't have done it. It was because we started so basic. We started with no one listening. We started with no reputations that we were risking. We were just two nobodies. Um, that uh, I think that's what allowed us to like gradually build up and learn the lessons as we go. I think obviously it's if we started from where we are now, that would have been awesome, but maybe we would have never got to this point. There's uh, a book we did a podcast on, a book club about uh, – it's called the innovation stack. I don't know if you've heard of it by Jim McKelvey. He's a uh, co-founded square and I assume square international, like you, y'all have square. A little, uh, uh, yeah, maybe not, not so big, but um, is it like the well, um, portable it. FPOS stuff? Portable. What? It's, 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 it's credit, card card so like credit card. Yeah. 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 So that yeah. it basically opened up uh, accepting credit card transactions for all these small businesses but they talk about the innovation stack of like uh, you get one little innovation, say you just have a, a cool format for your podcast where your buddy's riffing and then you buy better mic and then you get better notes and better uh, editor. And you just kind of build this stack that now you have a moat and it's, it's so hard or it's intimidating for anyone else to get started. So that's why I think at this point you're, you're like, you're untouchable for a lot of people. Or at least they think that. Well, that resonates a lot, I think. I think that sounds like a book we we must do. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's exactly right. It's like this this stack of all these things that have come together, and I feel like we've got a bit of a moat in our own niche, in in a sense, and we're kind of happy to share with everybody what exactly what we do, because um, because there is so much effort involved with that 
cumulative moat. So much effort to actually get to that point that yeah, we'd actually encourage you. the blueprint. Like, you, you're yeah, not, exactly. You're not trying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's that's so badass. With one thing that was interesting, I heard you guys talk about was the idea of monetization. And you do have a large audience, but for three and a half years, I think you guys said you chose not to monetize at all. Do you think that was still the the right call looking back? Like right now, I guess you're, you might come up with the dopest book of 2021, but like, what, what's your philosophy on monetization? Has it changed? Would you do it differently? For me, I think the first three and a half years was probably the tale of sour grapes, potentially. Maybe we were saying we, oh, we don't want to monetize but in fact, our audience was at a level where it wasn't even worth it anyway. Mm-hmm. But then when we got to the point of where we had enough of an audience to monetize, then our rationalizations in our brain kind of switched a little bit towards, towards monetizing, <laughs> monetizing it, to be honest. So, you know, I'd give us the benefit of the doubt at the time, but there probably was a hypocrisy to our style at the start. But, our, but we are true in, in the sense that we only want to bring sponsors on the show who do resonate with our messages and products that we believe and also not interrupting the flow of the podcast. So we did some, some compromises to make sure we were happy that we're not actually uh, killing the golden goose. Like you might be familiar with that analogy of you got the, the gold, the goose that lays the golden eggs. You can grab the eggs or you can actually kill the goose in search of quick and easy money. So just making sure we're actually not killing the goose with all of our decisions around monetization, we're not compromising on the wrong things. Mm. Yeah. I think for me, I think um, it's still like we've had like sponsors and advertisers. Um, so like Blinkist, which is like the book summary app, which lines up very well. Uh, we had 99 designs, which is, which we've u- we both use like to do like our initial book covers. And so we figured, Hey, if anyone else is like building a website or writing a book or wants a, a logo or anything like we, we believe that that's a good way to do it. Um, so those ones made sense. I think still though, even with the, the ads, like for me, I would rather uh, write a book and sell it to the listeners or like, you know, make something else that whereas people, um, listeners that find value in it are paying effectively um, as opposed to selling the ads and the sponsorship. But I think there's, there's room for both. It's not like an either or. Um, and so we sort of like... Um, have a, a good mixture of both like the, the book coming early next year plus the sponsors um, on a, you know, on and off sort of basis, I think is we sort of like find the, found the right mix at the moment. I feel like it'd be cool if you guys had little book clubs and invited all, you know, all those single 30 year old women that are just <laughs> loving your podcast or whoever wants to come on and you have these little <laughs> zoom calls and you just, riff and they're like oh my god we're, we're, we're talking with the boys like this is this is so awesome i think that would be cool as uh, like a community aspect i don't know right now have you guys thought about that or done anything there we we sort of started but i think like most things we went too early um like a lot of things we went early on before we were sort of ready and one of those was like setting up like a patreon sort of book club we sort of we thought hey it'd be awesome how about it? we did something like that it probably wasn't as you probably articulated better than than we ever did but um something along those lines we thought that would be cool um uh, but we sort of just we probably went too early it was when no one else was listening so there was there was only a couple of people jumped in um it could be a good idea something to do in the future maybe it is surprising how important timing is in in everything it's mm. like uh there's this um well, i don't know have you guys heard of the hustle uh, maybe not i don't know like how oh it's not international but it's this huge newsletter i was talking to the the woman that runs it and she's like if i started my blog a couple years earlier on remote work like it just it wouldn't have made mm-hmm. sense but she started at this like perfect time and just blew up and it, it's the case with any product out there so who knows maybe the second go around it, it's going to work. But yeah. for you guys right now, what's, uh, what are you thinking? Say five years, 10 years, are you going to do the podcast forever? Like what's, what's the vision going forward? Cause you're pretty much successful at this point. So what's left to be done? I think it's keep going, uh, with the podcast being the main driver of ideas and then building new things off the back of that. So, the obvious ones, the new book we're releasing, but off the back of that, I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of new, um, new different avenues we can explore beyond that. 
we've both got a full time. Uh, well, we've both got day jobs as well still. So it's kind of cutting that back in the direction of, of the podcast going forward as, as when it makes sense. Um, and who knows where it could be, but I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's the infinite game. I forget what Simon Sinek uses, but like our jam is probably, yeah, bringing the ideas of books to the world and then whatever means of doing that, whether it's a podcast book, might be an online like some kind of pitching at universities, making an online, if we're making not even an online course, an in-person course or something at university, whatever it might be, it's, it's bringing the ideas of the world through, bringing ideas from books to the world. Yeah, I know I, I forget, I think it was actually you, you were talking about how in general having just people reading more, like that's, that's one of your core tenets, just like consume more content. And then I forget if it's like, just talk about it or like produce or like do something with it. Like just start taking more action. Is there advice that you would give people in general? Like, you know, you guys make it look so easy. And then would you tell people like, Hey, just start a podcast too, or like find your little area and and run with it. Like what, what advice do you typically give to people that, that look up to you? I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, what I've, I've said, I'm sure I stole it off someone in the past, but like, can, like consume is like the first level. So that was where we started. We started just like reading books and then there's the step above that is curate. Uh, so that's like how we started with the podcast. We're taking the best ideas and sharing them. Um, so we weren't really making new ideas ourselves. We were just like collecting the best ideas and sharing them. Um, and then the, the level above that is like create. So after you curate, then you create. So maybe that's when you're injecting a bit of your own ideas and sharing some new stuff. Um, I think anybody can jump from consume to curate and it doesn't have to be a podcast. Like the, on the bigger level, it could be the a podcast. It could be a, starting a YouTube channel. It could be starting a blog. It could be starting an email newsletter, but I think it could even start smaller than that. Like just in your, in your team of four people at work, um, you start a, a book club where you read a book a month and, and talk about it, or even you just email to them, Hey, I read this book and here are the, the two or three best ideas. Um, so I think just like any small step in the direction from just consuming and stepping more towards producing, whether that's just sharing other people's ideas is I think a good step in the right direction. And if anything, having some sort of proof that you're just a cool person, like I'm, I was talking to someone, uh, public speaking coach, the other day and he was saying how youtube video is just like your interview your virtual interview like someone can see all your content or mm -hmm. uh, listen to you it's kind of the same thing or you know you're writing a blog that's your your resume or your transcript mm -hmm. transcript if you're in school i guess but uh it is important to just put your content out there clearly i'm sure you could go to anywhere in the world and people are like holy shit they look at this beast that they've made i want them uh the atoms to to work for me uh, whatever it might be. I think there's I, so I, much. I, don't know. I wish, I wish it worked that easy. I don't know if it's quite that easy, but yeah, it's a, I feel like it is like a, it is like a step. If you can say, Hey, I've, um, you know, I went to university and I studied and then I worked at these three places is like one way to do it. But then if you could say, Hey, I actually made something on my own. I feel like that. Well, maybe I'm just like wishful thinking, but I think that's a lot more powerful um, than just like listing the previous places you've worked before. Yeah. A lot. And I might just add to, our show's riff. I think something that might be helpful for a lot of helpful for a lot of people is just removing the expectations around getting paid for your work, especially at the start. I think I think that can work in any single context. He's like, do side hustles, just put money out of the picture, do things that intrinsically motivate you, and and only do that. And I think you're going to end up doing a whole bunch of interesting projects, learning interesting skills, and ironically, over time, I think you're going to get paid more. Um, because of that. And you're also going to be doing more likely be doing something that's in the direction of what you're personally curious about. So for me, I'll just give an example. My day job was, I was working as a structural engineer doing tall concrete buildings, interested in the sustainability stuff, then doing a side hustle, a volunteering project on sustainability. And then I kind of had these new skills. So I was kind of the niche of the sustainability dude in structural engineering and then I had new opportunities because of that. It was all because it was kind of volunteering for free on a project that was in the direction of my curiosity. So I think 
that's uh, that's something that's I'd give to to people as well. Yeah, having that almost apprenticeship, just like offering your services, or like especially if you're benefiting, you're just learning something. You guys have clearly learned a lot from reading all these books. Like it's it's very intrinsic at this point. What's interesting too, Jonesy, is hearing about. I think you said like all of construction is pretty much custom to each sort of building or whatever you're, you're creating. It's like, what if we just had stock? This is like the design and this is how everything works. I, I think there's so much room there that I don't know. That was just a tangent, but it seems so interesting to me. I'm, I'm curious about that now. Absolutely. Well, if you look at the automotive industry, uh, they do one prototype and then manufacture that and pump it out in some cases, like millions of that single car with the, uh, in the construction industry, every single building, we're basically designing a prototype and starting from scratch with every single go. Like as an engineer, we'd start from the ground up, design every single beam, every single column, do the wind loading again, as opposed to just designing the one type of building and then replicating it in many different places and uh, making a few tweaks to the architecture by keeping the core structure the same. Uh, there's huge opportunities there. If you look at construction in general, it's like the, it's lagging every other industry in terms of innovation. So I think it's a really exciting place to be in the next few decades because of this. There is a lot of automotive people entering construction and uh, there's a lot of disruption actually happening right now. There you go. So either start a podcast, just start consuming content, maybe get into construction because that'll be opening up some more doors. But, uh, Mm. I know y'all got to go pretty soon, but is there anything else, uh, especially for like young 20 year old advice that you might give or like, uh, any stories along the way? I know Jonesy, you've taken a a different path with traveling all over the place. Is there anything that you would advise your younger selves to do? I'd I'd say for everyone, just, uh, just do a whole bunch of shit and read, read books and do shit. Um, know what your, uh, your your curiosity is there's going to be social pressures for you to conform to what your parents want you to do to what lecturers want you to do um just be aware of that that social pressure and know when to push against it and have and run your own path uh when the time is right yeah i think that's that's a good too simple read book one step one read book step two do shit i think that's like a good good simple way of doing it like there's um I feel like there's a lot of pressure, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? It's such a hard question to answer and you can think about it. Like you can sit there and, and imagine what the different scenarios might look like. But I think the only way to really get a better understanding of yourself is to do shit, is to get out there and start doing something, whether that's, it could be making a podcast or a YouTube channel. It could be starting a, a small business. Um, it could be just, you know, starting something with a group of friends where you try something new and different, uh, whether that's a new project or that's a new skill, just basically trying to do anything that isn't just the the normal way of doing things. So trying to, trying to do new stuff and you'll very quickly realize much easier rather than just thinking about it. If you actually do something, you'll quickly realize, do I like this or not? Is this something I want to dedicate more time to or not? So yeah, do shit is probably the, the simple two, two word answer to that. Do shit and then buy in 2021 whenever it comes out the that's shit it. they never taught you <laughs> that's uh, it. and listen to uh what you will learn podcast I, I think this has been awesome guys i appreciate it. you're awesome to talk to i'm sure there's some more stories i'd love to hear them someday but uh thanks for coming on guys thanks so much for having us man it's been uh great to chat and uh and uh looking forward to the next stages of your growth as well sure had a ball man loved it all right peace boys.